episode 135 of CPP Cast with guest Arno Schudel, recorded January 24th, 2018. This episode, we talk about the Outcome V2 Boost Peer Review. Then we talk to Arno Schudel, Technical Director at ThinkSo. Arno tells us about their custom ranges library and more. Welcome to episode 135 of the CPP cast, the only podcast for C++ developers by C++ developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co-host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good, Rob. Did you uh, survive the snow last week? I did survive the snow. Uh, my whole family was trapped for three days with five inches of snow outside. Not completely trapped. I was able to go out, but, uh, but the schools were all closed and everything. Yeah, five inches is a pretty big deal down here. Yeah. Although, I mean, are you in a part of the country where there's lots of four-wheel drive pickups and stuff around and Jeeps? There's definitely lots of pickups and lots of people driving SUVs. Yeah, I'm, I got a Subaru, so I was able to go out. But, you know, black ice is still pretty scary, even with four-wheel drive. Yes, I was thinking that, actually, when I was out with the snowstorm that we got, um, you, you see owners of, of four-wheel drive vehicles. I won't mention any particular brand names or anything <laughs> that... Drive as though somehow four wheel drive is magic and yeah, it yeah. will prevent you from sliding and whatever. It's not really how it works. No, not at all. Anyway, uh, at the top of our episode, I'd like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, this week we got an email from Sebastian in Germany. Uh, and he writes in, uh, Dear Robin Jason, first of all, thanks for the great podcast. I'm following it quite often. I'm looking for a link in the new section of an episode, but I can't remember which one it was. Maybe you can remember and help me. Uh, you told about a speaker at a conference who built a Qt app with Qt Creator in one hour and deploying it on various platforms, Android, Mac, Windows, Linux. I hope you know which one I mean. Thanks a lot in advance. Jason, this sounds like... Uh, something from Pacific Plus Plus? Yes, that was one about? of the talks from Pacific Plus Plus. It's up on YouTube, um, and it should be pretty easy to find since there was only 10 talks at that conference or whatever. Yeah, I think we talked this in our episode where you were still down in uh, New Zealand. Yes, I believe yeah. I was sitting on the floor of the kitchen of an Airbnb <laughs> that I happen to be staying in at the moment. Right, well, we will uh, we'll find the link to that and put that in the show notes for you, Sebastian. But uh, yeah, I need to watch that talk too because it sounded really interesting. She deployed it, is, it to like multiple mobile platforms, right? Uh, I don't remember how many actual deployments she got working live, but definitely I, I demonstrated she said, like, that Android it was and iPhone, Android and iOS, yeah, and yeah. and then was running it locally also. So it was, um, you know, uh, there's there's a lot of live coding. It might be one of those videos that you watch at two x or something, sure. but yeah. Okay. Well, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show. You can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email us at feedback at cppcast.com. And don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes. Joining us today is Arno Schottel. Arno is a co-founder and technical director of ThinkCell Software. Uh, ThinkCell is the de facto standard when it comes to professional presentations in Microsoft PowerPoint. Arno is responsible for the design, architecture, and development of all our software products. He oversees ThinkCell's R&D team, quality assurance, and customer care. Before founding ThinkCell, Arno worked at Microsoft Research and McKinsey and & Company. Arno studied computer science and management and holds a PhD from the Georgia Institute of Technology with a specialization on computer graphics. Arno, welcome to the show. Hello. Wow, that's a right. lot thank, of hats you wear. Much. Thank you much for having me. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, that's a lot of hats that you wear at your company today. Uh, well, I mean, basically, we're just two founders, right? So uh, one guy is more... We have two computer scientists, in fact, so it's all run by, by computer scientists. But um, there's just one guy who's doing the technology side, which is me. And um, then there is Marcus, who's doing more the managerial side. Um, everything else, basically, but development. And um, yeah, so... Wow. Okay. I'm kind of curious what you did at Microsoft Research. That's, uh, from what I understand, an interesting world to be in. 
Yes, um, I mean, I did my PhD in uh, at Georgia Tech, and I did computer vision at the time. Um, so it was really related to my to my PhD. I actually had, um, it, I, you know, PhDs are really relevant for the real world. So I had a fish swimming in front of a green screen uh, for a while, recorded that, and then you could were able to like steer the the fish with a mouse through your 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 fish tank. You know, these are the kind of relevant things you're doing for, for the PhD. <laughs> but it's, it wasn't quite all, it wasn't quite all like that. But I mean, part of it is. Um, and, and then I actually went to, um, after the PhD or, or actually during my PhD, I thought, okay, before I stick to computer science for the rest of my life, oh, I would like to see the real world. And then, um, I, I went for an internship, um, to McKinsey. And that's where, um, the idea of ThinkCell came about, um, because there were many people, well-paid people, they were all hunched over laptops and, uh, they were pushing around PowerPoint shapes. And, and, uh, I was kind of dumbfounded, like, you know, we were in, in my PhD or using really smart algorithms to solve problems like the fish tank. Uh, and here there were people who were having a tough time pushing around PowerPoint shapes. And that seemed odd. So, um, we started working or, or, that came, that created the idea of of making a tool for for PowerPoint that does it a bit uh, smarter than than PowerPoint alone. Okay, so uh, we'll definitely talk more about ThinkCell in a little bit, but first we have a couple of news articles to go through. Uh, Arno, feel free to comment on any of these. Okay. All right. So this first one, uh, Outcome V2 Boost peer reviews have begun. Um, so obviously we've had uh, Niall Douglas on the show uh, twice before, and last time we had him on, we were talking about the Outcome Boost review, which obviously did not uh, get accepted because we're now talking about Outcome V2. So hopefully he will have some better luck this time. <clears throat> it seems like he really kind of trimmed down the library. It says he got rid of anything that even smelled like monads. Right. Yeah. Is there anything else you wanted to highlight with this? I do think it's funny that at the top he says, I'm sure RCPP is sick of hearing about outcome and expected by now. <laughs> but uh, So with the last time we had him on, shortly after that we had Charlie on and we talked about the review process. Yeah. And so this is Niall, and as far as I can tell, again, Charlie is doing the review for V2 again, which is just, an, uh, it seems like an astounding amount of work to be involved in this stuff and the amount of comments you have to sift through. And Well, yeah, I mean, Charlie, I think, said he went through like 300-some comments, if not more. At least, yeah. And that's over just like a 10-day period, I believe. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. Uh, have you done any work with the uh, Boost review or uh, Boost libraries, Arno? Um, well, we've we've done actually. Um, well, we we contributed a bunch of things to to Boost, but nothing in the in the um, the scale of a of an actual review. Um, so I was always a bit scared about actually <laughs> doing a review, um, in particular like if we are, have our own range library or something, and to contribute that to Boost uh, would probably involve a lot of work. Yeah, yeah, yeah it definitely seems like it's a lot of work. Uh, to do big contributions like that. Okay. There is in this uh, Reddit discussion, someone talking about a proposed feature to C++ and, and now I'm scrolling through and I can't recall it. Oh, here, here it was. It's something about uh, return types from functions and I don't know, whatever, but uh, Niall's uh, comment is that yes, there's currently a proposal to do this, but it'll be at least C++ 23 before we could expect to see any movement <laughs> on that. <laughs> Yeah, and I think the committee is probably even, that's even more work than doing a boost uh, contribution. <laughs> oh, yeah. right. Yeah. Okay, this next thing uh, we want to talk about is the CPP CMS, uh, Contact Man Content Management System, I believe CMS stands for. Mm -hmm. um, and we've kind of talked about this type of thing before and whether CPP CAST could move to a C++ based, uh, you know, web management system, because right now we do everything with, uh, Oh, it's some JavaScript project. I don't really know too much about it, but it works. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, did you look at this in any detail, Jason? Do you think it's something we could possibly use? I, I looked at the history and uh, such, but I didn't look at the actual feature set, honestly. Yeah, I'll have to look into this a little bit more to see if it's something that maybe we could switch to, because I'm sure uh, building the CPP cast website with C++ would be nice. Yeah, I did notice that they just updated their automated build systems, and I had to do a double take because I wasn't sure like when the when that uh, post was written mm -hmm. because it says they just upgraded from Windows XP to Windows Seven on their automated build system, and I'm like, wait, yes, that was written in December of 2017. 
Um, but at least they're they're getting their their build system updated and updating all their compiler tool sets and stuff. And and they just changed the licensed MIT. Yeah, I was going to say that that's the big change that they're announcing here that they're moving from uh, LGPL to MIT license, so commercial projects can use it, which is great. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's also the Boost Beast that came out pretty recently, right? And mm -hmm. the uh, Boost 166, which is also a um, an H basically HTTP server um, tool for the, this time in Boost. I think it's Boost ASIO uh, based. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes. we talked about that on the show a while ago. Oh, okay. But this is uh, this CMS is more like a CGI gateway kind of thing, not an HTTP server. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then the next thing we have is uh, obviously we're talking about Meltdown Inspector a lot two weeks ago. Um, there's still more uh, content coming out with people trying to address these vulnerabilities. Uh, the Visual C++ blog wrote this post on, on Spectre mitigations in MSVC, and apparently they are putting out an update that'll have a new flag, uh, slash Q Spectre, which will help... Um, with the Spectre Variant 1 exploit. Uh, I didn't, don't recall that there were two different types of <laughs> vulnerabilities within Spectre, but it looks like this is fixing the bounds check bypass. Uh, so if you are working on you know sensitive code, then you might want to update your uh, Visual Studio compiler if that's what you're using and take a look at the Q Spectre flag and see if... Uh, See if you can use it and see if uh, it affects your performance in any way. This, I think they're saying in most cases it's not affecting performance, though. Well, yeah, this, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, just uh, I mean, actually today we actually flipped the switch and, and, and tried it, and I don't know, I couldn't see any difference. But I mean, what, what's kind of special about this security flaw is that any mitigation you do is going to be imperfect by nature, right? Because the, the, the flaw is so deeply seated in the processor that yeah. that you can you can kind of kind of fix things of like known exploits of that particular flaw, but you're not going to fix the, the underlying flaw itself, really. Yeah, uh, it's <laughs> ridiculous. Although I, um, I noticed that in the Microsoft specific version of this, they're adding a one single instruction called LFENCE, and I didn't even know that this CPU instruction existed on x86 architecture. I never heard of it before. Yeah, I'm not familiar with it either. But yeah, that's the only difference in the, their output assembly example between using Spectre and not using Spectre, the addition to yeah. the LFENS. Yeah. Okay, well, Arno, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you do at ThinkSell? We talked about it a little bit in your, your bio and, and PowerPoint and everything, right? Sure. Um, so um, basically the idea was uh, to to automate this this shape pushing right on powerpoint and and it's kind of funny that that being in 2017 uh of course with word processing we kind of take it for granted that whenever we type text that the words don't stick to the page wherever we type them but they get automatically word wrapped um now this doesn't really happen in powerpoint right so if you put a shape or in any other drawing program for that matter so if you take a shape and you put it on the slide it just stays where it is and whenever you want to change something, you have to rearrange all the rest that's also on the slide. So the, the basic idea that we started ThinkSell with, and, and that's been a while ago, um, is that you basically want to be able to change objects on the slide or add objects, remove objects, uh, and your general layout stays 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 good, stays automatically, adjusts automatically um, to, to all the changes you do. Um, and we actually started off uh, with that idea, but then uh, we decided, well, okay, what we're going to need first is some, some of these, these, these elements that we're going to automatically lay out. So these could be charts. And then pretty much we did charts for, for 15 years uh, or maybe 10. And, um, and only now really we are, we are getting into um, having the first release with um, one of some of that that automated layout uh, technology being actually effective for the user. So we have the first elements that are actually kind of floating on the slide and are adjusting their positions automatically. And you can you can um, specify how you want them to relate to other objects. Um, of course, that's that's tricky to do. I mean, it's mathematically challenging. It's challenging from a user um, interface perspective because the user has to tell uh, the system what he actually wants. So this this turned out not to be an easy problem, but I th I think we're getting there, and um, and it's it's been interesting all the way. 
And so it's the idea is just, just to go ahead, Rob. automate people's workflow when using PowerPoint so they don't have to do as much, you know, kind of by hand manipulation of a slide, that type of thing. Right. So you would basically, um, it's, it's a bit like Lego, right? You, you put your first element on the slide and you snap your next element next to it and you decide whether you want a gap or not and something below and something above. And, uh, and then you fill in your content and the layout should stay in such a way that you could actually show this to a, to your audience at any time, uh, without actually doing, doing manual adjustments. That, that's the idea. So it's, uh, it's a plugin. It's a plugin. To PowerPoint. Okay. Correct. Just making sure I, I was getting that. And, uh, all of this work, uh, for this plugin is written in C. Yes. Um, so, I mean, basically everything we do is in C++ because we have we built a large library over time and the best way to leverage that is just to build everything in C++. Um, we have a bunch of build scripts uh, in Python. Um, that, that's about it, I think. That's not C++ really. Uh, it seems like uh, an interesting choice. I would expect most things that are Office plugins are written in C Sharp or something in the .NET family. Um. Right, and, and and most people actually do write these things in C sharp, and and it turns out uh, to be a terrible choice. Um, there is well, <laughs> no, it's a disaster. Really. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I tell you the story. It's 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 terrible. Uh, so so the problem is, um, or fact of the matter is, the Office APIs are all com. Office is written in 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 C plus plus, right? So uh, first of all, you're not gaining any functionality if you were going to .NET because all you are you are talking to is basically the other side is always com. So you're gonna do, uh, you're gonna do all this interop, and and you're just losing performance. Okay, so far so good. I mean, you still can like C sharp and 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 write your things in C sharp. But uh, the problem is that com is based on reference counting, and um, when the reference count falls to zero, you get you your object gets destroyed, right? So you get deterministic destruction as soon as you release the last the last pointer to your object. Now. C sharp is built on .NET and is garbage collected. And thus, all that destruction is only happening, at least by default, if you don't jump through many hoops, uh, when the garbage collector is running. Now, it would be nice if Office would be written in a way to be able to deal with this non-deterministic destruction. It is not. So, but you have a C sharp add-in and you are getting a PowerPoint shape from PowerPoint and do something with it and you release it. Or you let the, let the pointer go out of scope. Well, in, in C++ parlance. Now, the garbage collector, of course, hasn't run right away. So now an underreader happens in PowerPoint and that pointer is still being held. And that makes the shape that the pointer was pointing to kind of live on as a zombie. And when you're doing calls to that shape, you get, you get funny behavior. You get, you get, you get strange errors. You can't do much with this thing anymore. And it's not like this only applies to the shape that, that has gone out of scope. I mean, you don't have any access to it anyway. But if you then go, basically, you have one C-sharp add-in, um, which does that, and then you have our add-in, which access the regular PowerPoint shape collection. It just gets a fresh pointer. Even that fresh pointer that you're getting is going to be, is going to point to that zombie. Hmm. So what we have to do, in fact, um, because there's so much C-sharp code out there that um, when we are detecting this kind of problem and there are certain telltale bugs or telltale errors that are thrown from, from, these, from the COM API, um, then we actually enumerate all the .NET app domains and trigger the garbage collector just to kill the, do- kill the zombies. And then we release all our pointers again and, and, and restart. <laughs> and you really need to do that. So, I mean, don't get me wrong. There is a way to write correct C-sharp code that interoperates with Office. But it, all the convenience of garbage collection is pretty much gone. You have to do explicit releases. So you have to be careful that there's no temporaries that create it anywhere, because as soon as you have a temporary, this thing will go on the garbage collector and you have a problem. So you have to explicitly name everything, and then you have to explicitly release everything. And that's a, that's a disaster to program in. It's, 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 it's terrible. And, and of course, there are tons of code out there where they, 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 they don't get it right. And it's, it's very hard to, to, to audit this kind of code. Um, so, I mean, if you want to take my advice, if you have, want to do any serious office development, by no means, don't take C-sharp. Never, ever. It's terrible. It's really that bad. So this is, if I were to try to 
bring this back into, I don't know, I guess the C++ kind of world, this would be like having to manually call the destructor on every single object. Does that sound right? That sounds about right. Yeah, that, that does not kind sound like of fun. S- <laughs> no, it doesn't. Not at all. And you get it wrong. Wow. I imagine you get it wrong regularly. That's the point of destructors and deterministic lifetime. Exactly. So all this, these benefits of Rye are just out the door at that point. Wow. Uh, one thing we noticed on your website is that it says even your uh, customer portal is written in C++. Is that true? That that is true. Um, we started off a while back with with or when we started the company, we started off with ATL Server. Uh, that that moved on from there. Uh, but yes, I mean we we built a big library, and and a lot of that stuff that we built has is is not really specific to anything. I mean, um, you you can find uh, the public the public part of the library on GitHub. Um, but it just made sense for us to leverage that um, also for the web server, um, because really, I mean, you, it's when you have when you're writing C++, there is this this certain strictness about writing your code, and that carries carries over well to to writing your web server. I mean, you have a very stable web server; it, it works great, and uh, yeah. So yes, so it also is written in C++. So I, I am kind of uh, curious. It seems like uh, the Windows APIs, and I don't know if it's true with the Office APIs too, are not exactly known for modern C++ uh, techniques. Do you have any difficulty like integrating what you want to, you have your modern C++ uh, uh, techniques with the Office APIs? Um, well, I mean, yes, there is a fair share of glue. Um, so, so when you have a collection, I mean, you, you want to express that collection as a range in, uh, in, in C++. So of course we have glue for that, but... I mean, really, um, at the end, you just have objects, and you have just have calls to these objects, methods, um, and and there's not too much more to that. Um, it's it it works okay. Um, it's it's not really a problem, and and you you just have your glue code, and then you write modern C plus plus on top of it. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned ranges right there. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about the ranges library that ThinkCell made? Sure. Um, so the ranges library, part of that is actually public uh, on GitHub. Um, and there are, I, I mean, the, um, the the main, I think, driver uh, for ranges is, is currently Eric Niebler. And um, he has, of course, his range v3 library. Right. Um, and so um, we, we grew out of boost range. We kind of grew our own library. Um, and... And use it throughout our code, so it's been it's been well used, and it gets adjusted all the time. We have the freedom to change the interfaces still, uh, because we it's kind of a monolithic thing. We can we can you know we have the library and and we have the code base, and we can change the library um, and and then change the, the code base along with it. We actually have one uh, guy who is actually doing just nothing else but code refactoring, so um, so that that's pretty comfortable to or it's a comfortable way to build a library really. Um, that it's a luxury that not many people have. Um, so we don't have a stable interface. It's it won't change dramatically, but it's it's okay. Um, now it's it's a bit different from or in, 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 while building that library, we made, made some choices that are a bit different uh, to the choices that Ranges V3 made, um, and, and most of them growing out of pragmatic solutions to to problems we had. Um, one one more ideological difference is we don't have a pipe operator, uh, which I think is the, the, the telltale sign for, for um, Eric's library, um, just because we think that, that it's, a, it's a special case solution for a general problem of how to call functions. Um, I, I do like the uniform function call proposal uh, from Herb Sutter, um, but I, I don't think it's going it, to... It's, it's, there's no sign of it being, being adopted, if I'm informed correctly. Yeah. Now... Um, there are a few di- other more pragmatic differences. Um, the the uh, way that the range library deals with R value containers. Uh, so so you say you're generating a container um, and and want to stick that right into a an adapter, in a filter adapter. You want to filter a container that you just created. Um, now in in Eric's library, that that wouldn't really work because um, as soon as that when you're referencing this container that you just created, um, as soon as you end the statement, you would get a dangling reference to that container because the container is a temporary, right? Now, um, the solution uh, that we have is that we actually aggregate the container 
into the into the into the uh, into the adapter. So um, the that way, kind of the 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 transform or the filter becomes a container rather than a view on a on a on a container. And I think Eric has has ideological or or, or has, has has qualms with this solution because uh, suddenly uh, what what you think may think is a view uh, on on some other or a reference to another container suddenly kind of becomes a container itself. Um, which which may be theoretically not as sound as you may want it to be. In our experience, it doesn't really is a, it's not really a problem in practice. So that's the solution we adopt, adopted, uh, and I think it it avoids uh, the programmer having to resort to more roundabout ways to writing that same piece of code. Um, so, for example, if you want to return something from a function, which is this kind of Filtered container. I mean, if, and, and where would you put the container if you if you filtered it? You, you you would have to kind of return two things. One is the actual filtered range, and the other one is the container. And because they they don't aggregate with each other, um, so so that's one that's one difference. Um, the uh, there are a bunch of subtleties with transforms uh, that maybe is a, a bit too detailed to go into right now. Um, there are completely different. Um, type of ranges that we support. Uh, we call them generators. They're basically um, visitor pattern in, in generator disguise, so, so or in, in, in range disguise. So if you have a function that just enumerates the elements, just sticks these elements into a functor, into another functor, um, you can, you can on, on that, if, if you have such a function, you can implement many of the, of the adapters, in particular filter and transform, uh, or things like concatenation, you can implement this on this kind of object. So you suddenly have ranges that don't have iterators anymore. They just enumerate their, their elements, and, um, and you can still use the same kind of algorithms that you would use on regular ranges. That's kind of nice because because you know you you have have a sometimes just generating or or creating a a, a container that that passes out iterators it, it can be clumsy it, it requires a lot of work but writing something that just enumerates its values is often much quicker to write and uh, and you can use it with the same kind of algorithms and the same or some of the same kind of algorithms and some of the same kind of of adapters that you would use regular ranges so so that I think was is, is very useful um, in the code. So, in your version, you uh, you said that the the range is uh, an owning thing. It is the container, right? Not always. Some, I mean, it it can be if you if you pass it an R value. Okay, okay. I was just curious. So then, if if it was always like making copies when you were doing the filters, but it sounds like no. No, that would be terrible. But okay. it gives you it gives you the, at least the option. See, with with the ranges v three, you kind of have the option of having a lazy view on a range, mm -hmm. or you have you you um, if you want to actually work with an R value. Of course, you can execute whatever filter or something you have eagerly. So okay. you so these are kind of the choices you have. I, I think he calls it views and actions. Now. The thing is, these I think these two concepts are really orthogonal. So you can have you can have laziness on containers, and of course you can also have like eagerly sort a range. So you have two concepts that don't have much to do with each other, and I think they should be really treated separately. Um, it's it's certainly when you're creating a vector, and and if you only need the first element of that vector, and you have a filter on that vector, it's certainly not efficient to filter the whole vector. It's it's much more efficient to aggregate the whole vector as large as as it may be. It doesn't matter. It's a pointer at the end. Um, just into your actual filter, and then return that, and and see whoever what whoever um, consumes this thing can then decide what to do with it. And if you only need the first element, uh, you just take the first element filter until you get the first element, and then you throw away the whole vector. So uh, that that is certainly a, a more yeah. I, I think it's a good way to do it, and um, I think you need this kind of this kind of uh, way. I mean, if you need it in the in the syntax, we do it. For us, it makes no difference. You write TC filter, um, no, no matter if you have an R value or an L value. And maybe people feel uneasy about that and they want something more explicit. I, I think that's fine. But I think you should have the option of uh, aggregating your container into the range. Sounds interesting. How much are you using your ranges library throughout your code base? Throughout. Everywhere. Yeah. I mean, it's... it's, it's uh, and, and there are very subtle things... Uh, that you discover uh, when you actually use that that um, 
that that library so much. I mean, uh, stdmin is broken, for example. The standard stdmin uh -huh. is broken um, because it it binds to like con like our values bind to constref. Yeah. Right. And then it returns the stdmin returns the its return value as a constref. Now, so it turns silently turns R values into L value references, and you lose the ability to see whether things are an R value. It's for for these range libraries. It's it's you, you need to know whether to aggregate or not. Uh, and and in the transform, in the case of the add transform adapter, there are other decisions that you have to base on the fact that something is an R value or not. And when you are then suddenly there is a function that that silently turns L values into R values. Uh, that, that, that's just not a good idea. That causes problems. Have you uh, made a proposal or anything to fix or to make a, an R value clean version of stdmin and some of these other algorithms? There, there are, t there is a TC min. I mean, in the in the public library, um, there is a version that that basically just says, okay, I mean, if I'm getting an R value, um, I I have to stick to an R value. I have to leave it an R value, and there are interesting things like when you when you are getting, say, a const ref and a ref ref, an R value ref, stuck into a TC min. What's the return value? And I believe the correct return value is actually a constant R value, um, which which combines the 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 fact that you cannot modify it because it may be the const ref, with the fact that it may be going out of scope because you got an R value. So so you got the worst of both worlds of a const ref and a ref ref. Which is then a const ref ref. So right. I mean, in the beginning, you would ask, "What do you need const ref refs for?" Well, I, I think this is very much what you need them for, and and the type system does the right thing. The only thing I think that where C plus plus is wrong is to bind R values to const ref, which of course is, is has historic reasons, but it's one of the many things which have historic reasons, but are fundamentally, I think, not correct. Hmm. So you gave a talk on your ranges library at meeting C plus plus. Is that right? Right. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, if I caught this right, at the end of it, you say that you hate the ranged for loop that we got in C++ 11. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so, <laughs> with a passion. Um, no, so the, the problem with it is that um, we are now tr try to train developers to think in algorithms, to use all these r tools that we have on ranges. Um, say, filter and transform and all these things. Now, but at the same time, or maybe a short time before that, we now gave the, our developers a new way to write a loop, a, an explicit loop. And that makes people use it. And that's really the problem. So people start off with a range, they, they, they see a range, they start off with a range-based for loop. And because of it, because they have that range-based for loop, um, they are never jumping to a, a, an algorithmic solution that would take a lambda. So in, for us in, at ThinkCell, we actually don't use a range-based for loop, but instead force people to write a, a, a TC for each, basically a STID for each for ranges, using a lambda. Just because the, when you already have a lambda and you already wrote a lambda, to make the jump to say, hey, maybe it is better instead of for each, maybe an all off or a, an accumulate or something like that would be actually the better choice, the, the better choice and the better tool to use that to make that jump is then much easier. And, and getting people from going from the, the, the range based for loop to actually wrapping the same thing into a lambda frequently just People didn't do, and and then they are basically stuck in that old for loop world that that we actually didn't want anymore. Hmm. Makes sense. Um, your range library started as a fork of Boost Range. Have you forked any other Boost libraries? Um, not to the same extent. Um, I mean, we we do have um, contributed a bit to to Spirit X three. Um, made it a bit faster. They, they kind of aborted parsing using exceptions and, and that was slow. So we, we replaced that. Uh, but that has all been merged. Um, the, and we use Boost Spirit actually for, for parsing throughout. We don't, we used to use regexes, but they, they're just terrible to maintain. And it's one of the other things that I would not like to have, I, that I would not like to be in the standard because it's kind of a case of, of when all you have is a regex, then, then well, you, you're going to use the regex and you just stop looking for alternatives. Um, and so, so, so boost spirit is one. Uh, we have our own boost operators, uh, which is basically injecting 
operators based on on uh, you basically have modifying operators and you want all the all the dual versions like the the, the you generate the plus from the plus equal uh, things like that so there we have our own version um, we we found a bit of work on the CLP which is a, a linear solver that's what the math we need for for the the automatic layout so this kind of stuff but no, nothing to the extent of of what we did with the rangers I think um, the, the range library does contain a bit of like utilities on 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 type traits and and other useful like like the TC min max for example um, things like that. So if we uh, since you mentioned uh, think sell products again, if we can go back to that when I was looking at the product, I'm like you know this kind of speaks to me because I don't use PowerPoint anymore because trying to manage all of my slides for all my presentations and teaching material it just becomes like it's just too much work. And you were talking about watching a bunch of, you know, people just hunched over the computers pushing slide elements around. And uh, so I, I use other tools that help me build presentations that can do automatic code formatting for me. And in particular, I like automatically highlighting, syntax highlighting, code formatting. Is that anything that your tool can do? Can it help like the programmer making presentations also? Not really. Um, I mean, I myself don't use, I don't use PowerPoint for my presentations. Okay. <laughs> just, just because, I mean, if, if you, yes, it's a pain in the butt. If you just have to write code, um, it's, it's terrible. And the thing is, the market is just not there. Um, I, I, we thought about like doing something like, like a markup to, to PowerPoint converter where you can really write, um, write text. Because I mean, nothing, nothing is as quick to write as, as, as text. Uh, Especially, I think for programmers, right. and and right, so so it would be kind of natural um, to do th this kind of converter. Um, we this has always kind of been an idea, but we never really followed up on it. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think I can help you much there. Okay. Well, and also thinking about how you implement it, you say you use C plus plus. It's so much better than the idea than C sharp. But in your job posting, you also say that you've um, used some assembler glue, and I'm curious what. That is for. <laughs> well, um, I mean, we are interoperating with, with with Office a lot, and and the public APIs just don't always do what you would like to do. Um, things like uh, synchronizing with the undo queue, right? So when the, the user is working with our software, she is expecting that when you press undo, that you get the proper undo behavior, but that's kind of not exposed. You don't really know when when to do the undo steps. Um, that that's one thing. The other thing is that you may want to have uh, your your API or your your UI, your 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 visuals tightly integrated. So uh, with with Office. So for example, if you scroll a slide or if you zoom a slide in and out, you would expect that your elements that you kind of attached to the slide, you'd attach to the charts on the slide, say that they also uh, zoom in and out, um, and 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 that actually uh, we we solve by by disassembling uh, PowerPoint and Excel uh, with the IDA disassembler, and um, to find and then we we go and and find this the the hooks that that we can actually patch, and there is um, we built a little patch searching engine uh, when whenever PowerPoint starts or Excel starts we actually go and go through the code. Um, and, and search for these patches. And it must be somewhat robust because, I mean, Power, uh, Microsoft puts out hotfixes all the time, so we can't break all the time. So we need to um, be robust against small changes in the code. Um, so we, we have the scanner, we scan the code, and we set the, set the hook. Uh, and obviously, that, that's, that's work, um, the low-level work, the function hooking work, uh, that, that's done in assembly. So you have to discover the name of the function that you want to hook. Then Not you have the name. To... I mean, you have to find it in binary. Okay, so, so you're not looking for symbols in here. Oh, no, there are no symbols. Okay. You just ha you have to just find it in binary. It's a, it's an I it's an IDA, right? You got a disassembler. Okay, so I'm curious what what exactly are you looking for then? Certain byte patterns once you've identified the code or or what? Yes, I mean once you identified what you actually want to hook, um, we usually take a small patch around that place. Uh, of, and, and, and then look for this by pattern. Uh, there are certain things you have to robust, be robust against. For example, um, if jumps change, like the compiler changes, sometimes jumps from, say, jump zero to jump non zero. So basically it turn, turns around the, the parity of the jump. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are things that we have, we have to be robust against. Um, 
some some other like long jump versus short jump, these kind of things, like simple changes in the assembly code. Uh, you you have to be robust against when you when you actually do that scanning, and otherwise it will just break too often. Um, but if you do that, then it's then it's actually manageable. And since you're running as a plugin to PowerPoint, you're already operating in its address space and permissions and and whatever. So you're not Correct. you're not doing anything that's going to alert Windows that you're you know. <laughs> No, and we actually, I mean, I mean, there, we are not the only ones doing this. Um, I mean, sure. there, there, there are DRM tools, uh, that try to prevent PowerPoint from doing, from, from saving files. Um, there are, there are, of course, all kinds of malware scanners, uh, that, that try to detect behavior. Um, so we are not the only ones patching around in, in process, uh, in, in process address spaces, uh, but, um, maybe we are the only charting, um, add in that, that does that. It's very interesting. And I wonder uh, if this is, you know, something we could have dug into last week when we were talking about the overlays with like GOG, uh, GOG oh, yeah, and uh, yeah. Steam and whatever with games, how they, they patch executables too. That's uh, certainly a realm I've never, I've never worked in personally. Yeah, it's interesting stuff. Um, bringing it back to the range library, um, you know, ranges, I believe we're hoping is going to get into C plus plus 20. Um, have you thought about recommending any of the changes you've made in, in, in Thinkthel's range library to Eric Niebler and the standards committee? Or do you think, you know, C++ developers are still going to be pretty happy just getting any version of ranges? Um, so far, what I've seen in the ranges TS, uh, we, we, um, we, we looked at that stuff. And um, there was one crucial thing that was pretty early on that we, that we had changed, and they actually did change it, oh, okay. um, is that when you when you get an iterator from a range that um you you must make sure that the range stays alive and that's something they actually added to the standard said that basically the iterator validity is 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 tied to the range validity that if you don't do that um you you there's basically no way that i know of to implement efficiently um, filter adapters, because if you, when you are stacking filter, the, 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 the point is this, when you have an iterator of a filter adapter, um, the iterator just by itself, if it, if it doesn't reference any, 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 any range, if it doesn't have, if it cannot store extra data anywhere, um, then it has to store its end iterator because otherwise while filtering, it will basically fall off the edge. So we are mo moving forward your iterator uh, uh, until you hit your filter criterion, but you may hit end. And, and so you need to know where end is. So you need to store the end iterator. And, um, when you now start stacking these filter iterators, then every one of these, so you have a filter of a filter of a filter, then every one of these filter iterators would store two iterators of its underlying iterator. So you get a combinatorial explosion in the size of, of, or not a, a, is it, no, it's not combinatorial, it's, it's, uh, ex exponential. Mm -hmm. So you get an exponential explosion in the size of your iterator. So at some point when you have 10, stack 10 size, uh, then you have a 10,024 word large iterator that you're moving through your program. That, that can't be, that can't be efficient, right? So, um, and we made this one, we have this one crucial change that, that, um, allows, us to to efficiently implement iterators. There is one uh, one thing that we did in our library, um, which goes beyond that. When you when you're sticking to what Eric did, um, you get uh, linear still linear growth in the size of the iterators. That's much better than, certainly than exponential growth, uh, but it's still kind of bad. So and there is a way to do without, um, which is not precluded by the standard. So you can you could implement it. With the standard, standard conformant, uh, and, and still get small iterators. But Eric doesn't have, hasn't done it, and you need extra concepts. You need like an index concept. If, if you're interested, there's the, the talk on the, on the website, um, on our website, uh, talking about this index concept. And then you can actually implement filter or transform or things like that efficiently. So with small iterators. Okay. Uh, Jason, you have anything else you wanted to ask? I don't think so. Okay, well, Arno, it's been great having you on the show today. Um, is there anything else you want to tell us about ThinkCell before we let you go? 
Well, um, I mean, one thing is, of course, we are certainly looking for uh, C++ developers. So we try to hire as many as we can. Uh, we certainly, I, th I think we have a very high quality bar. Uh, so, so it's, it's not so, it's, it's quite difficult to get in. Uh, but we are certainly, we are, we are really looking for, uh, developers and, uh, we would, we would love to hear from, from anyone looking for a job. And you are in Berlin. We are in Berlin and, uh, we are, um, currently everyone is, is on site. Um, and yeah, so, so, so far it's, it's basically relocation to Berlin. Okay. Well, it seems like Berlin has a, a great C++ community. I mean, with uh, with Jens out there running meeting C++, I'm sure it's a really strong community. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, it's been great having you on the show today, Arno. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for listening in as we chat about C++. I'd love to hear what you think of the podcast. Please let me know if we're discussing the stuff you're interested in. Or if you have a suggestion for a topic, I'd love to hear about that too. You can email all your thoughts to feedback at cppcast.com. I'd also appreciate if you like CppCast on Facebook and follow CppCast on Twitter. You can also follow me at Rob W. Irving and Jason at LeftKiss on Twitter. And of course, you can find all that info and the show notes on the podcast website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode is provided by podcastthemes.com. Podcast website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode is provided by podcastthemes.com.